configuration intermediate level. So target audience would be uh, people who have uh, already e executed an SSH command at one point in their um, deliver, developer or administrative lifetime, but have not delved uh, deeper into the possibilities of SSH. So that's, that's the target audience I'm, I'm, I'm uh, uh, trying to reach. If you, if you already know more about the SSH config file, of course you're free to stay. Um, maybe there's a little nugget of knowledge that you haven't seen yet or haven't heard yet, um, but otherwise you probably will, will be bored, just so that you're warned. Um, so yes, uh, the, the hashtag if you want to tweet or, or, or uh, toot or whatever, it would be M MCH 2022. And the slides would be, will be available later on on my website as well as in the far plan, or the, the schedule, sorry, wrong, wrong event. Um, <clears throat> I'm getting confused, I'm getting old. Right, uh, before we start, just one word on command line syntax. So I have a lot of uh, command line examples. Um, I'm also doing some live demos, so just let me know if the font is too small or something, we can arrange something, and I can um, modify a few things. Um, in order to make it more readable for you in the slides, I'm, I'm following the POSIX uh, 2017 standard uh, that a new line followed by a backslash uh, shall be interpreted as a line continuation. Uh, to give you an example of that, so the, the command ls uh, minus a minus l minus t slash temp would be, could also be written as ls backslash new line minus a, minus a backslash new line, et cetera, et cetera. The right hand notation is just more readable on slides. You can just compress it into one line once you execute them. Right, so should we get into it? I think we should because otherwise I'm running out of time, but I think we're good on that. Um, that's, that's your usual command, right? That's what you do if you do SSH on a machine. Um, you have the command SSH, then you have the username, the at sign, and then the host uh, that you want to reach. Once you, once you enter, enter that, um, whoops, not yet. Once you enter that, you, uh, the server prompts you for the password or even wants to verify the, uh, the, the, the uh, fingerprint of the server and then asks you for the password. And if you then, then you do your work, you disconnect, later on you connect again, the server again asks for your password, you type this in over and over and over again. It's, it's a little bit boring if you're using S STP, for example, to copy files, again, uh, you have to, to, to execute uh, SCP, username, at hostname, then it asks for the password, and that's rather boring and, 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 and repetitive, so let's see if we can do something about that. And I mean, this is, of course, the uh, easy example. It could be a lot worse. If you have a system administrator who's heavily into uh, HP Lovecraft-inspired uh, server names, you get server names like these, and I think you don't want to type this more than once, right? I mean, that's just uh, calling for problems. Fortunately, uh, this is, by the way, the god of Tsukranosh, um, and is one of the greater old ones, in case you wonder. Um, the thing or the, the SSH um, feature that we are going to use and which I will spend a lot of time on is called SSH config. Um, so um, if you do a man, a man 5 SSH config, this is the information you will get. I mean, this is a lot more content than the man page. Um, basically, you can configure your SSH command, of course, through the command line options username at host and a few other, uh, other uh, commands and parameters. You can use a user, um, a user configuration file, so this is a configuration that is applicable to, for and to each user. Each user can have his or her own um, config file. And of course, as a system administrator, you can also uh, provide a system-wide configuration file for the SSH client. Um, in this, in this talk, I'm going to, to focus on the user configuration file, um, which is hosted in the user's homepage, which is um, simul, um, symbolized by the tilde, and it's in a hidden, in a hidden directory called .ssh, 
and it's called uh, config, surprisingly. Yeah. Um, what can we do in that config file? Well, what, for one thing, um, we can define hostname aliases. So in case of, of the name of an elder god or something like that, you can just define the host demo and then uh, specify one or more host names this applies to. Oh, the other one, no, sorry, sorry the other way around. So you have one host name, your target, your, the server you want to reach is ssh-server.example.com, and with the host statement, you can give it one or more um, aliases, which is useful, which cuts down on the characters you have to type at the command line um, quite heavily. And you can not only have uh, one alias for the same host name, but you can have several aliases for the same host name. So you can have demo, d1, or popo cut the petal, if that's more your thing to type. And so instead of sshserver.example.com, I just type sshd1, and that cuts down tremendously on the number of characters I have to type um, to reach that server. Um, furthermore, the host name also has a nice feature um, to use a wildcard to support um, grouping similar host names. So if I have um, SMTP, IMAP, and uh, www, host names that are all uh, connecting to the same, to the same, or resolved to the same machine. Um, I could use the uh, percent H feature uh, to, you, to um, use the, the alias as the host name in the um, fully qualified domain name of the host name uh, parameter. Right, so that already, so instead of um, SSH, uh, uh, ssh-server.example.com, we can just type ssh demo. So that's, that's one, one thing we can um, cut down uh, on typing. The other thing we can cut down on typing is, of course, the username. So I still have to, to type ssh username at host or at alias. Um, fortunately, the config file also has a user uh, directive, so I can specify a username I want to use for that particular host or alias, which cuts down on the amount of type tremendously. So compare these, these two statements. The first one is the one I showed you at the beginning. It's SSH username at hostname, and now I just have to type SSH demo, and everything I specified in my config file um, is therefore applied, and I don't have to type it um, myself. So um, this is all sounds good, but let me show you how this actually works. So I am on my, I am on my server, on my on my client, um, and I want to configure my SSH config. So I load, I start my my preferred editor, and I'm going to my. Let's see if I can type while everyone is watching. And there should be, there will be a config file. So I'm using an editor, not an operating system like Emacs. And um, this, is, this is what we just talked about. I have my target server, which has the host name of SSH server example.com. And I define two aliases here. One, one is demo, the second one is bastion, which I will need in a later example. And I specify my username um, for, this, uh, for this setup, which is, uh, in this case, LIDAR. And if everything works as I expect, I should now be able to do a SSH demo. And I'm connected to the server, and it uh, asks me for my password, and I'm connected to my server. So that would be... As I said before, uh, tremendous uh, cut down on the number of characters that we have to type. And as we are all system admins or developers, we are all lazy. We want to cut down on the thing, we, the stuff we actually have to do. We pre much more prefer to wait for the for the compiler to compile or to the uh, file transfer to uh, complete. Right. So as you noticed, this this cuts down on the connect. Whoops connectivity, uh, but we still, uh, the server is still um, asking for a password. So how can, we, how can we fix this? Well, there's something called SSH public key authentication. So that helps us, it, it uses basically the, the public-private key um, 
setup that we already know from TLS or, or other protocols uh, to use um, keys to authenticate against the SSH server so I don't have to provide my password every time I want to connect to a server. Additionally, um, the SSH public key authentication uh, pro improves security considerably um, and also offers additional usability, us usability benefits like single sign-on across uh, multiple SSH servers. And another neat feature I will show you in a little bit once we got this all set up. Um, the one thing you have to remember um, for SMA to Crypto Free, you probably know, but I want to emphasize this as I'm targeting maybe new developers or, or new uh, system administrators, is there are two keys in play with asymmetric cryptography. There's a public key and there's a private key. The public key you can share with everyone. That's uh, sharing is caring. Share your public key as much as you like. There's no problem with that. Put it on the server, post it on your website, send it through fax if you live in Germany. Um, it's fine. On the other hand, the private key, the private key is something you keep to yourself. That should reside on your laptop, that should reside on your, on your PC, and you should not hand that out. You should not put it in a Git repository, you should not pu put it on a, on a cloud store. This is your private key and your private key only, and it should not be shared. Um, if it happens, create a new one. Um, my preview just went out. But okay, that, this one is working. Okay, no worries. All right, um, we could do. We could. So basically, what it does is um, the the server and the client um, exchange a few messages, encrypting encrypting with the public key. So as a user, if you want to use private public key cryptography to uh, log into an SSH server, you have to to copy. One time you have to copy your public key to the server, so the server knows your public key. Once the server knows your public key, it can then send you during the um, um, initiation of the, connect, of, of the connection. It will, it will send the client a message encrypted with the public key of the client. The client can therefore decrypt that message with its private key, will encrypt an answer uh, that, that also includes the message that the server sent with the, pri with the, with the private key of the client and the no, with the public key of the server, sends it back to the server and the server decrypts it with its private key and checks that the, the messages were uh, transmitted uh, without change, therefore authenticating the client and allowing you to start to work. Um, this is all working under the hood. Um, it's using the Diffie-Hellman key exchange, so we know that it is secure and safe and it's properly implemented, um, at least in the, in the more um, uh, used uh, uh, distributions. So this is really, it's really simple and it's a few commands um, and you're, up, uh, you're, you're on the way to go. So, what do you need for public-private key cryptography or public-private key uh, SSH authentication? You need a key, of course, you need two keys, a public key and a private key. The command to create that would be, come on, SSH keygen. So SSH keygen has quite a lot of parameters. Um, these are the ones I regularly use and I usually recommend. Um, so you have the command SSH keygen or key generator. Um, and then um, you're, using, uh, you're specifying the type of um, uh, public-private key cryptography that you want to use. In this case, I'm using Curve 25519. Oh, it's raining, nice. It's 25519, which is an elliptic curve, which creates highly secure but very small keys. So this is really a nice feature if you're, using, uh, if you're working with uh, embedded systems and stuff like that. They are usually happily using um, 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 to, uh, elliptic curve uh, cryptography. Of course, you could also you still use uh, RSA keys. They're just 40,000 40, uh, 40, bit uh, length is fine and uh, works as well, uh, just a little bit bigger and all modern systems usually support ED25519, so it's good. Um, the A option is, um, is a pet peeve of mine. Um, you can leave it out if you want to. That's basically defining uh, the number of rounds um, that the uh, algorithm uh, computes when it creates the key. 
um, the higher number will result in a slower passphrase verification um, process, but it will increase your resistance to brute force um, password cracking of the private key in case it gets stolen. So that's basically um, uh, a security feature in case your private key gets accidentally uploaded to GitHub or something like that. I think we have to turn up the volume because the rain is getting really loud. Thank you. Um, the, minus F, um, <laughs> the minus F option um, is there to uh, specify the file name where you want to save your um, private key and your public key. Um, you specify a file name and the extensions will be added as needed. In this case, and I usually do that, I save it into my home directory, into the SSH directory, and I named it in this case demo.ed25519 because I do it. What I would highly recommend is to always, if you're using SSH Keygen, to always add a comment with the minus uh, capital C option. Um, because if you have multiple keys, figuring out which key belongs to what and which key applies to which server or to which customer can get quite tedious. So having a comment reminding me, oh, I created this for MCH, okay, I can delete it, or oh, I still need it, or whatever. So um, having a comment in the key is always um, a very nice feature. So um, let's, no, let's, before we look at that, let's, let's do this. Um, again, I have my command line and I create a key. Um, as I said before, I have it here in the per line syntax and here in the command line, I'm just using one line. I'm, you should always have a passphrase on your key. And of course, if you type in public, you never type the password correctly again twice. Let's see. Okay, three times a charm. Not talking and typing at the same time helps. And once the computer is fini has finished its, its computations, you get an, an, an output like this. And let me show you a little bit more about that output. So that's the output, basically. And the first thing it, it, it is, um, it's telling you, OK, I'm creating an ED25519 key pair. And it asks you for a passphrase. As said before, you should always have a passphrase that should know no private key without a passphrase except for some very special circumstances where you should really know what you're doing. As we're talking about intermediate level setups, you should always have a passphrase for an SSH key. Um, once SSH key can, uh, has finished its work, it also ch can generate, it tells us it generated two files. Um, the demo ED25519 file, that's your private key. If it has the extension .pub, that's your public key. Please don't mix them up. Please don't upload the private key to GitHub or GitLab or another of these um, um, sites. These files are actually text files, so you can take a look at them. So let's take a look at the public file. The public file begins um, with the information, OK, which, which uh, encryption algorithm did we, which, which um, um, asymmetric option did we choose? We chose um, ED25519. Then there's the key information. Again, this is the public key. You can share this freely. And the nice thing about it is at the end of the public key, the comment gets added. So if you add this to a server, the administrator also has an option to see, OK, whose key is this? Why is it there? Um, so choose a, a, a proper comment, and it will your life and the life of your administrator um, a lot easier. Um, I'm doing this here as it's a demo setup and I scratch it, but you should never do this in public. Um, you can also, of course, take a look at uh, the private key, which basically looks like this um, and resides on your client. Um, again, the, anyone with a copy of the public key can encrypt data for you, but only you, if you own the private key, can decrypt. Um, so this, this um, 
authorized keys for you are really your thing and you should handle your private key very carefully. Um, on the other hand, um, the public private key um, key pair is free. They're free to generate. You've seen this takes literally a few seconds to generate once you have the command down. So please, please, please create more than one key. If you connect to different servers, if you connect to different customer servers, for example, have at least a, a key pair for each customer. If you're, if you're connecting to GitHub and to GitLab, please create a public private key pair for GitHub and a, se a separate one for GitLab. Because what happens if you lose one of these keys? If you, have, if you only have one public private key pair, all of the systems are compromised. If you have, um, if you have a public private key pair for each customer or for each service that you're going to use or for each server even that you're going to connect to, only that server is affected and only you have to, to um, um, make the, the system administrator of that server aware. There's nothing, there's nothing for, I'm, I'm, I'm doing a lot of consulting work. Um, there's nothing more embarrassing to, than to tell the customer, look, I lost the key pair for, for, the, for access to another customer's servers, but your servers are also affected because I use the same uh, public-private key pair. That's not, a, that's not a nice thing to communicate. So um, they are free. It doesn't cost much. A great one for each server, of each customer, or each service you connect to. <coughs> Sorry. So... Um, that was the creation of the key pair. Just give me a second. And I already mentioned that we should the next, that in order for this to work, we have to copy the um, public key and only the public key to the server we want to connect to. So there are several options to do that. Um, you can copy it through um, the clipboard, you can um, uh, f transfer it as a file, but, and that's the nice thing, there's also a command for it. So there's SSH copy ID, which will allow you to copy the, um, to copy the public key to a server um, that you want that public key copied to. Um, again, it's the same syntax as for all other uh, services, and I see I missed, um, I missed the server name there. I will show you in the, in the, in the demo how this actually looks. Um, and where do you copy this? So SSH copy ID basically takes care of everything. You just tell it, take this public key file, copy it to that server. You don't have to think about directories, uh, file names, etc. If you want to do it manually, you need to copy the demo.ed25519.pub public key file to the server into, into your home directory, into the .ssh directory, and into the authorized keys file. This authorized key f keys file, if it does not exist, needs special permissions. So if that file does not have 644 file permissions, the whole thing will not work. Again, SSH copy ID will take, will take care of that for you and will create that for you so you don't have to think about that. That's why I'd like to prefer um, the SSH copy ID command over the manual creation of that file. And also in newer versions, so if you're on Debian old stable, probably not, um, but in newer, in newer releases, um, the SSH copy ID file also makes sure that you're not copying the private key to the server, so it's an, a nice um, security feature as well. Right, um, so let's see if, if we can do that in my um, demo environment as well. So again, the the command here, um, uh, is, is this readable or should I make it bigger? It's good? Okay, great. Um, the command is again SSH copy ID minus I and the ID file, the public ID file you want to copy, and then the target in the our system demo. The nice thing about having a config file that we created earlier is these aliases that we created there apply to all SSH related commands. We can use the same alias for SCP, for SSH copy ID, and all the other stuff. So it's really nice. So in this case, demo is our alias for lira at uh, ssh-example.example.com. And it says, okay, 
Yep, I found the public key file. I'm uh, attempting to uh, log in. Of course, the, the public key is not uploaded yet, so it, so it still asks me for the password. And remember, uh, please enter lyra at uh, sshserver.example.com's password. I enter that, and it tells me, hooray, successfully, I uh, connected to the server, I uploaded the, the public key to the server, and let's try, let's try again to log in. So, SSH demo. It, why is it asking for the password? It shouldn't ask for the password. Ah, yes, of course, because I'm stupid. Um, <clears throat> we still need, we still need to, to, to tell SSH that it's, it should use the, the ID file to, uh, the, the, the private key to connect to the server. So let's try again, specifying the um, identity file that we want to use. Well, come on. <laughs> Uh, I'm, so I'm on the server. Thank you, that's a usual mistake I make. Yes, correct. Thanks for staying with me, awesome. So, third attempt, third time's the charm. Yes, and now it's not asking, and if you look closely, it's not asking for the user's password, it's asking for the passphrase of the private key, which, this, which is a different thing, right? and it's connected to the server. Hooray, Oof. thankfully. So we now basically have established that we can, um, let me just log out here again, because otherwise, ah, that wasn't good. That was one, that was one log out too many. Uh, ba -dum -ba -dum. Yeah, all good. Um, so that's basically, we were basically verifying that the public-private key authentication um, was successful. Um, of course, the next thing would be to uh, modify our configuration file so that we don't have to pass the identity file, the private key, as a parameter while calling um, the SSH command. So let's do that quickly. And that would be these two lines. Mm, .ssh config. Oh, let's do it properly. And we just add two additional lines. The preferred authentications uh, public key, it's basically just speeding up things. So I'm telling the SSH client, don't even bother with, with username, password, just try public key authentication and nothing else. And with the line identity file, I, I specify the file that I want to use for uh, client authentication, uh, public private key authentication. And if I save that, and now what I had in mind should work. So we have the username, the target host, and the identity file that we want to use in the config. And again, it's asking for the passphrase, and um, I'm able to log in. Yes, Ray. Some. It's nice when something works. Again, uh, preferred authentication is public key to speed things up and the identity file to, um, to use in that case. And again, public private keys are free. They are easy to generate. Use a different identity file for each service or for each server that you want to connect to. And we said before, um, SSH demo, and we, we don't have to type that much, which is awesome. Hooray! Um, next question that usually comes up at, when I give this talk is, yeah, but we haven't, we haven't, we haven't f improved anything. We still have to type in something. We don't care if it's the username or the, pass uh, the, the, the password for the user or the passphrase for the private key. Yes, that's true. Um, but there is a solution for that. Um, so we are now at the stage where we have public-private key authentication to the server enabled, which is, of course, more secure, et cetera, et cetera. But how can we 
um, work around the issue that I still have to enter a passphrase uh, for that key. And again, it's the passphrase for the key, not the user's password. Well, there's something called SSH agent. And SSH agent is a small program that runs on your machine, creates a socket, um, and waits for SSH uh, to request the private key um, unencrypted uh, to make to do its work. This is very, very convenient. So you basically you start SSH agent, you do an SSH add to add that key to the agent. Uh, the agent keeps that key in memory. Um, and makes it available to the SSH client in case um, you want to connect to a server. So you only have to present the passphrase once, and after that, the second, third, fifth time, it does not ask for the, for the passphrase of the private key again. That's the hardcore low-level command line only um, option. If you're using a graphical user interface, um, if you're using GNOME Keyring or K Wallet, or if you're using a Mac, um, the SSH agent functionality is usually is, is usually in, uh, incorporated into into uh, these tools. So if you're using the GNOME Desktop, um, usually the GNOME Keyring. Um, um, decrypts or decrypts or opens has has all your um, SSH private keys um, unlocked. That was the word I was looking for. Unlocked as soon as you log into your into your operating system's desktop. On on Mac OS, that's the same for the keyring. You log into the Mac OS, and all the SSH uh, uh, client certificates are unlocked once you are unlocked into the system. If you have high secure uh, um, requirements, if you have requirements for a high secure environment, you want to rethink this, and um, maybe you, you, want, you will have to um, enter the passphrase every time, and in my uh, advanced, advanced, advanced talk, um, we can also take a look at storing the private, the, the passphrase on a FIDO2 device, or use FIDO2 or, or, and other stuff to do, to do, to do two-factor authentication, too many tools in there. Um, but for now, um, let's, let's take a look at SSH agent. Again, if you're using a graphical user interface on your, on your laptop, and of course 2022 is the year of Linux on the desktop, um, so let's do that. Yes, one more thing on the SSH agent. Um, you can, um, if you add a key to that SSH, so SSH agent runs in the background and waits for a connect. Um, and if you add your private key to SSH agent, you can give an option of minus C, which will instruct SSH agent to, to prompt you, are you really, uh, do you really want to use that key now? Um, this is so, this is their stopgap to, to make it a little bit more secure, but again, if you have high security um, requirements, you might, might want to rethink the usage of SSH agent. So, Again, SSH agent is running in the background, and I need to add um, my private key identities to, to that agent. So there's a command for it called SSH add. Um, if you give it, if you don't, if you only give it the, the file name, it will add that uh, key to the to the um, SSH agent keyring. Minus D removes it, and as I said before, minus C will prompt you uh, for usage every time you want to use it. So, to connect without a passphrase, we're almost there. Um, we only have to add our private key to the SSH agent. I think that's good. Um, so, uh, oh, I really have to type this. Oh my God. SSH add. Now let's do it again. SSH. Add minus E. Ah, the choice of switching between German and American in, uh, keyboards. <laughs> yeah. And so basically, I'm, I'm telling SSH add, um, add the file, the, the file demo.ed25519, which is my private key to the SSH agent. Ah, yes. Hooray. Thank you, demo gods. Um, 
Yeah, yeah, I know, I know, I know, I know what the problem is. Let me just um, because I I, I um, exited out of that session, so I lost all the. Um, Let me first switch to the proper keyboard, and then it's easier for me to type. Yeah. Um, I wanted to hide this from you, but apparently that was unsuccessful. Right, so let's try again. SSH add. Yes, and it's asking me for my passphrase. Finally, it works. Yes. Every command with SSH requires you the minus I if you specify the ID file, the, the, the private key, except for SSH, SSH add. It's and now I get the message identity added. So SSH agent now knows um, about this uh, private key and I already committed my passphrase. So the unlocked private key is now stored in the SSH agent memory. And if I do an SSH demo, we should see no password, yay! <laughs> One more thing, the nice thing about SSH is um, once you have this fig configured and running, what you, for example, could do is an SCP. So SCP is copy, right? It's file copy. It's like a local copy, but over the, over, over, over the net. And I, get, I want to copy something from the server to my local machine. So I give it the alias. Again, the config file works here as well. And then say, okay, I want something from etc. And now I do a double tap on, on, on the tab on the tab key, the tab letter key, and I get remote uh, tab completion, which is very nice and, and very convenient because I can't remember the paths and the file names. I'm old. I don't want to think about those. So. Once you have public-private key authentication set up, you, you will get remote auto-completion, which I, in my personal opinion, is worth the hassle to set it up once. It's really, it's really, really, really cool. Right. So, that was one of the benefits of having public-private key uh, authentication. Yeah, I skipped that. Um, one thing I wanted to mention, Ooh, need to speed up a little bit. Um, one thing I wanted to mention is this is also available um, on Windows. So if you're using PuTTY, um, you, have, you have basically three commands. You have PuTTY GAN, which is your key GAN for Windows. You have your PuTTY agent, which is your SSH agent. And you have PuTTY, which is your um, SSH client. And with PuTTY GAN, um, what you have to um, keep in mind is there is a button there to say, which says save public key. Um, but that is saved in a proprietary format. What you need in order to uh, get public private key going is the, actually the public key text that is, is, is displayed in the, in the bottom, uh, in, the, in the top, in the top of the uh, putty key generator. That's the thing you want. Uh, on the server to actually work if you're connecting to an open, uh, open SSH server. Other than that, it's completely the same. At the, at the bottom, you can specify uh, which, uh, which key to gener generate, RSA, or in our case, ED25519. And it, you, you will get a private key. You want to save the private key in this case. And if you start put the agent, um, you can add keys here. Again, it's the same as in Linux, but you have fancy buttons and, and, and user interface for that. And in, within PuTTY, uh, if you go to connections, SSH, auth for authentication, so it's, it's rather 
it's a very con a convoluted navigation. You can actually specify the private key you want to use, and then you get the same functionality, the same benefits as on Linux with, uh, if you have to use Windows because your customer only supports uh, Windows as a desktop. There's also more. Um, there's more SSH config magic. Um, what you have to keep in mind for SSH config files is for each parameter, the first value obtained will be used. So more, you want the more specific stuff on top, and you want the more general stuff at the bottom of the file. Yeah, because it's not going to take the last thing, it's going to take the first thing it finds. If you specify something else below, SSH doesn't care about that. So you want host specific stuff at the top, general defaults at the end. How does that look like? Um, so in this example, um, if I connect to, if I want to connect to um, an, an, a server like um, web.prot.example.com, it will take my prot ID private file, the last one um, at the bottom. But for one server, which is unicorn.prot.example.com, it will not take the prot ID at the bottom because I have a more specific uh, thing on, uh, above that, and it will take the fluff, uh, pink fluffy ID as the uh, private key for that, for that particular server. And for all the servers that are within the test.example.com uh, domain, um, it takes the test ID. Uh, private file. So this is something you can easily set up. And again, um, more general stuff at the bottom, more specific stuff at the top. Uh, to give you another example, um, this is again uh, something from, from my demo here. You will have your, we have our demo host entry with the host name and username and preferred authentication. Then we could have several more host entries, and then we have a catch-all that is host asterisk, and that's basically setting uh, additional stuff. Uh, what I usually want to have is compression, yes, because I have to connect to servers in the US and Asia, so, so compression does help. And the identities only is also a nice thing, because otherwise SSH will just try every identity file it finds. Um, to connect to that server and you will get errors and with identities only. It will only use the identify, identity files specified in the host entry to use to connect to that thing. Um, I do have to speed up a little bit. Um, what you could also do is um, within the .ssh directory, you could have conf.d uh, conf directory where you can have multiple files so you can separate the configuration out for each customer or each server you want to configure and it pull, pulls those in um, in alphabetic order. Last thing I want to touch on, that's why I'm skipping this a little bit, is um, Bastion or Chump hosts. What do I mean by that? Um, you have your client, you have something called a Chump host or a Bastion host that is connected to the internet, and you have the actual server you, where you want to work on or where you want to work, uh, have to do some work on that is not reachable from the internet directly or from your client directly. So you have to go, go through that Chump or Bastion host. So what you usually do is you SSH into the Bastion host, then you're logged in at the Bastion host, and from there SSH to the target host. So basically what you do is SSH demo or Bastion, oh, let's, let's keep it with demo, right? And then you do, um, where is it? Yeah, and then, you S and then you SSH further on, and then you SSH further on to, and I'm using the same username here. I'm, 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 I like to, to explicitly uh, specify my usernames, target.local, which is a machine I can't reach from my client. Target, of course. Dummy. And I'm on my internal server. So that's what you usually do, and it's right, quite cumbersome because you have to log in and log in and log in and log in. Server client, here I'm correct. So what you, what you can actually do is you can specify a, a, something called a jump host. So with the option minus capital G, you can def define a jump host or a jump host alias 
that you want to use to get to the, to the target machine. So I want to connect to target.local, but I'm telling SSH to use Bastion as an intermediate, as a jump host. Of course, everything that, is specific, uh, that you can specify on the command line, you can also put into the, uh, config, um, in the config file. So in this case, I have my specification of my demo host alias, and I have an alias for internal. And if I specif if, and in there, in the host internal, I can specify proxy jump and the alias, and with that it knows, okay, if I just enter SSH internal, it will automatically use the bastion host to connect to that machine. So, do I have this prepared? No, that's bad. Uh, just give me a sec. There we are. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, on my client.ssh config, I'll add this and if I go there, so I now enter, enter the bastion host. So if I do an ssh target.local, no, just local. I, I created an alias. Internal, thank you. I created an alias called internal, and it tells me, yeah, you're connecting for the first time. Yeah, that's fine. And I haven't figured, I haven't configured pub, uh, public private key con um, authentication for that as well. The nice thing, the nice thing, if you configure it that way, is that the first connection gets tunneled through the SSH. So. You connect to the Bastion host, and then you connect through that connection to the internal server. So if you pass on the, um, ident the, the identity file, uh, the, the, the SSH agent can talk directly to your internal server. So you don't need agent forwarding and everything else, which is a lot more secure than having uh, SSH uh, agent forwarding running on that Bastion host. Um, but of course, it also works with um, Password authentication. Um, again, if you if you have an older uh, SSH configuration, you can also do, uh, fall back to the proxy command. I'm just leaving this here in the in the slides as a reference. Um, please, 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 please use the jump host directive. Use the minus J option. Do not use minus A or agent forwarding anymore. It's insecure. Uh, you shouldn't use it. Um, it's outdated. The jump host is the better option. Um, I will skip that. You can read on that uh, if you want to. And that concludes my short and uh, rather, no, a rather long talk. Thank you very much for your um, uh, participation and have a great day. Let's have one question. Yeah, yeah let's, do, let's do one. Thank you, yeah. Actually, yeah, the demo cards were not kind, but actually it helps to see that you make mistakes, we all make mistakes, and then we correct them and we learn. Um, we've probably got time for one, one or two questions, if, if anyone has one. Oh, we've got one here. <laughs> all right. Good morning. We jumped morning. in a little late, but is it possible with the job host to also forward local and remote uh, tunnel sessions? Yes. Okay. Yes, you, you, you can config configure it the same way as yeah. normally. Yeah, as, as usual. Okay, perfect. Do have that, one would more be, that would be my advanced, advanced talk. <laughs> Maybe next year, or next time. Right. I'm, I'm still around. I'm, I'm, helping, I'm helping with teardowns. So if you have any questions, feel free to approach me, um, and I will be around. Well, thanks very Thank much. Thank you very much indeed.